Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to Nature Live from the Natural History Museum. I'm Khalil Thurloway. If you're new to Nature Live, this is a show where we have in-depth conversations with expert guests from all around the museum and beyond, telling interesting stories from their work in all sorts of fields, from dinosaurs to DNA, volcanoes to vampire squid, and much, much more. Over the next 30 minutes, we're going to explore the idea of DNA that surrounds us all the time, how we can study it, and what we can learn from it. We do love hearing your input as well, so if you've got any questions or comments, please do pop them in the comment section and we'll come to as many as we can in the time we've got. If you do enjoy the show, please do consider making a donation if you can using the donate button if you're on YouTube or nhm.ac.uk slash donate. There should be a link coming up in the chat. So with that out of the way, let's introduce our guest. With me to talk about environmental DNA, I've got Darren Chunia from the Natural History Museum. Hey Darren, thanks for joining us. Hi, how are you doing, Dan? Oh, I think we're having a, a couple of little audio issues. Can we try saying that again? Hi, how are you doing, Dan? Ooh, uh, we might need to get our text to have a quick look at the sound. <laughs> um, but while, 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 we're, uh, while we're looking at that, why don't you give us a little bit of an introduction into who you are and what you do at the museum? Uh, my name is Darren Cheney and I'm a molecular, well, the senior molecular biologist at the Natural History Museum and I work on anything related to DNA basically. I've worked on various DNA based projects looking at parasites in human poo to the Darwin Tree of Life project where we're trying to sequence all the living organisms in the UK and even looking at environmental DNA samples in air. And it must be really cool having your work tie into so many different projects and areas of study because often when people uh, you know work in, in in research they tend to have very kind of specific narrow focus but you get to play with all sorts of cool projects. That's right uh, my background's in infectious diseases so then I was kind of focused in one area looking at a certain disease or a certain bacteria but coming to the museum and I just look out my window and I could say I could analyse this, I could look at that, ranging from the trees, the plants, the, the water in the pond and things like that. It just blows my mind and it makes me realise how big the world it actually is. And on the subject of looking out your window, we're here to talk about environmental DNA and that might seem a bit of a weird concept. So let's, let's unpack that first. What is environmental DNA? Um, Simply put, environmental DNA is just um, DNA that's found in the environment. So it could be found in soil, in the water, and in air. And uh, we basically, um, anal it may helps us understand more about what's in the environment. So normally we think of DNA as being something that's made and stored inside living cells, living organisms. It's where all the information is kept to, to the instructions for, for making that organism and, and helping it run. How does it get into the environment? How, why is it outside these living organisms? Um, it could be, the DNA could be found through um, animals, for example, the fecal root, so they're from their poo into the environment. Um, other sources, so bacteria, we still need to split open the cells to get the DNA that way. Um, pollen uh, from flowering plants, uh, fungal spores, but also um, the natural shedding of like fur and skin from various organisms as well. So our homes must be full of DNA then, if we're just shedding DNA all the time. Definitely, and if I um, was able to sample, say your home, for example, I'm sure we'll pick up human DNA in your environment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess there are humans here. But what you talk about sampling it, how do you capture, how do you sample this DNA? Because normally when we talk about extracting DNA from stuff, it's often, you know, you'll take a sample from a living organism and you'll you break open the cells and stuff like that. But if it's just kind of floating around, how do you get hold of it? So, for example, with soil, it's a simple method of scooping up the soil and then doing the subsequent work to get the DNA out of the soil and then analysing it. Uh, water is the same. We scoop up the water using these clean pots and then we have to concentrate that water up using some sort of filter and whatever's captured on that filter we then do the, the subsequent um, DNA workflows. So that's, you know, that's, I guess, um, that kind of, it kind of makes sense. You, you gather a lot of water and there's probably not, not a huge amount of DNA in there, right? So you kind that's of right. have to concentrate it. 
That's right. And it gets even more challenging when we go down to looking at air samples cause, because there's very little um, bio, bio material in air to begin with. So we need to have these, we have these sophisticated uh, instruments that collect air either onto a liquid, onto a filter, and once the sample's collected on that, we then have to concentrate that down and then do the subsequent steps to get the DNA out of that and uh, so we can sequence and understand what's in the air sample. So what we're looking at here, because uh, these these just look kind of like strange machines on tripods. Yeah, that's right. So um, there are three examples of um, air uh, machines that collect air, basically. So the big tall one basically collect air's air at a really high flow rate and it collects air onto a filter. The really small one on the tripod next, next to it, the similar process, but it has a, a slower flow rate. And the one in the middle, the white one, collects air onto um, basically a liquid. And again, they all have their pros and cons and um, what you kind of capture on them. So do you use different equipment when you're looking for different things? Um, yes. Yeah. Um, and, and again, you, uh, especially with the air, uh, when you're looking at something like air, you need to kind of take into account how much sample you want to collect, the time. And um, we've done experiments where we've collected air all around London uh, at different times of the day as well. And you could kind of see these like fluxes in uh, what we can identify in certain times of day as well. So you say that you're identifying things from these samples. What, what information can we get? It basically can tell us what's in the environment and how the environment can uh, changes uh, given certain pressures and time, seasonal changes. There's lots of um, information we can dig out from environmental DNA. So I guess that allows you to kind of combine a uh, whole ecosystem level analysis, you know, like looking for what, what types of organisms are, are present without even having to see them or find them physically that's right but so you're combining they, them with these really small scale molecular approaches that's right so there's two main methodologies of when we like looking at um, dna in environmental samples the first method is uh, basically called metagenomics where we collect our sample for example soil and we do the dna extraction and sequence what's ever in that and that gives us a, a snapshot of everything basically that's been collected in that sample. So, and if you want to look at something more specific, then you could go down the route of something called a meta, meta barcoding, where you kind of sequence these certain target genes of a cert, that's specific to certain species. So if you're interested in a certain insect, you could go straight and look at these um, uh, target approaches to look for them. Yeah, I was gonna say, it must be really tough to look for, you know, a genetic needle in a haystack because you must get a real kind of soupy mix of different different DNA origins in, in these That's samples. right and and we also have to take into account we are part of the environment as well so we can be potentially contaminating our samples as well so we need to take into account um, making sure that we're not cont contaminating our samples and introducing any sort of biases that could happen. Yeah, yeah so because you know often uh, you know DNA analysis work and stuff is done in in a lab in a very you know clean controlled environment but you know do you do you take this work out into the field um there is technology now where we can do um everything in the field so for example we have um this which is the bento box which is an all-in-one kit it has like a little centrifuge in the middle there's like um if i can open up sorry uh, Just don't um, drop it <laughs> yeah. there's like a, a little heat block as well here to do our sample preps and then we could go and use our in the field DNA sequences. So we have um, these. These are like um, the nanopore sequencing uh, uh, sequences. So basically, as long as you've got a power supply, you can do everything in the field now. Wow. It's amazing how, how you've condensed an entire genetics lab into three lunch boxes. Yeah, that's right. And um, it's the way I kind of see it, there's like three steps. It's, um, you, or four steps. You collect your sample, you break open your cells, you extract your DNA, and then you do the sequencing. And if we keep into those four compartments, we could basically um, take it out into the field. And like I said, with a power source, we're good to go. Yeah. And yeah, uh, you've essentially got a Pokedex, really, I guess. 
just <laughs> identifying organisms in the field. Yeah, and, and, on... and, and it's okay. like uh, there are like groups um, that do that as well. They go to these really remote and inhospitable places, like inside caves, and try to identify what are living in these caves. And before, it was unheard of. <laughs> So how can you tell what organisms you've detected? So once we've got our, our DNA sequence out and we basically have a string of A, T, C's and G's and the, the simplest approach is to compare that to a reference database of all the organisms that have been sequenced before and using uh, statistics and uh, bioinformatic tools um, we can basically um, identify with a relative accuracy what we've identified so um, we've had, uh, before we go any further, uh, we've had a really interesting question um, from one of our viewers, Tansy Blue on, on YouTube. And they're, they're saying, all of this sounds incredible. And it, it's saying that you've essentially got the dream job. How did you get into this? How did you get to yes. where you are now? Where you are now? Um, well, I was always, biology was always my strong point in school. So I kind of followed it through my sort of career from uh, doing my A-levels. Then in university, I did um, uh, a degree in um, biotechnology. Then after finishing my degree, I didn't kind of feel that I wanted to do any more sort of studying. So I worked for a bit in um, in an office-based role and I didn't really, really feel that was for me. So then I did my PhD in infectious disease and microbiology and then after that, just look for uh, certain jobs that kind of came up and I started off um, quite low down and then just kind of worked my way out that way as well. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, amazing it's, it's how amazing many different, how different. Uh, careers and different fields some, a place like the Natural History Museum brings together and, you know, different routes people take through it. You know, a lot of us started in scientific backgrounds and, and you know, I started in a scientific research background and now I just talk about science. And, you know, you've moved from infectious disease to environmental monitoring. It's, yeah. it's fascinating. And, and that's the, the beauty of science. You just have like loads, you develop so many transferable skills that you, that is so uh, thought after in so many um, different settings. And uh, going back to how you identify the organisms that you're looking for, we've had another question uh, from from Dan on Facebook, um, who says, how do you use eDNA to identify invertebrates when there are, you know, over a million known insect species? Uh, you know, have they all been individually sequenced? Do we have the genomes for all of them? No, and that's, um, again, the beauty of the big wild world. So we a lot of insects at the moment have been sequenced but we're just like um, a drop in the bucket when it comes to them so for example with the tree of life project um we've kind of barcoded well in excess over a thousand plus samples in the space of a few months but there's a lot of things that we don't know out there so it's up to taxonomists to go out there to visually identify them and say whether this organism is a new species and then we could do the molecular analysis on it as well and say, right, this is a new type of species and this is its sequence information. And then that data goes on to like a curated databases that's freely accessible to anyone. So as more things get sequenced, the better the data becomes. I guess like with all of science, it's a work in progress. I mean, will we, we won't even know if we've sequenced all the life forms on Earth because, you know, how, how would you know? And, and that's the scary thing as well, because we don't, know that much of all the organisms out there there could be organisms that haven't even been discovered yet already going extinct and that's the tragedy in its all in itself yeah yeah and I, I, that's one of the one of the really sad things about trying to study biology and study life at a time when it's so under threat yeah but there is hope as well so like for example um through edna um methods um it was possible to re-identify, re like rediscover a species of a Brazilian frog that was thought to have gone extinct of well in excess of 50 years ago. So even though we can't see it, we can still kind of track whether something is there as well. There is some sort of resolution there, yeah. And trying to track that frog by physical means, you know, if it's a, you know, if it's an Amazonian frog, you could spend years walking around the jungle looking for that frog. 
But now that we've detected its DNA, we know we can kind of concentrate efforts in certain places. That's right. And it's really so, interesting. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say it kind of helps you drill your all your resources into a particular area to look for it. And uh, the the question about the tree frog is also feeds into a, uh, a couple of questions we've had from our viewers about how how because how long does DNA persist in the environment? Because we've had a question from uh, who was it? It was one of our uh, YouTube viewers who said that, um, you know, would you be able to, for example, go into a, you know, a, a historical building or an archaeological site um, and sequence the DNA of past inhabitants? Um, yeah, with um, the DNA after a while, it fragments to a certain point where it's, it won't break down anymore. I mean, the museum has been involved with um, sequencing the genome of the Cheddar Man and He's well over ten thousand years old, so it, there are like methods in place to work with ancient DNA, and it has its own challenges, but definitely possible. So, how long does DNA last, and and what makes it, you know, what what makes it last, and what what can break it down? Um, the environment itself breaks down DNA. So, for certain things like UV light, that's a big one to break things down. Certain chemicals in the environment that breaks it down. Um, even bacteria. Some bacteria like use it as a as a metabolite. So, there are so many things in the environment that break it down. But as you kind of go down, sort of like in the levels of the soil, it becomes a lot more stable because it's less exposed to certain um, factors that can break down the DNA, where it becomes a bit more stable. And I, I think uh, there a lot of our viewers are really excited, you know, as I am, about the kind of the the possibilities of the, of how we can apply this technology. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, Tansy Blue has asked, can eDNA be used for you know surveillance and monitoring, for example, in conservation or looking for invasive species or infectious diseases? Yeah. I mean, it's uh, eDNA at the moment has been used, like for example, in the, Ever in the Everglades to detect the Burmese python, and that's a really big invasive pest. pest there. It's taken over the swamp lands and um, even outcompeting um, the alligators that live there. So it's mad. Um, as how how is the snake getting there? Is it a pet that someone puts down the toilet? That's what um, the the, the go-to like theory is at the moment, and because they have no predator um, out there, they just like growing like rabbits basically out there um but for the infectious disease side of things um yeah uh, it could still be used for that so for example um eDNA or I like to call it eRNA technically um can be used now where um do, uh, people are collecting sewage wastewater and from that sewage wastewater they're using that to detect COVID in that as a sort of like to, to monitor certain um cities for fluxes of COVID cases in an area so yeah, there's so many scope uh, where we can use these technology. Yeah, I really like the the idea of being able to monitor a species without interfering with it. So you know, for example, if you're trying to <clears throat> if you're trying to monitor and protect a really critically endangered species, it might not be great to be going out and constantly you know uh, you know in, uh, going into their environment, maybe kind of interacting with them, tagging them, stuff like that. If you can monitor them non invasively, that could be a real game changer. Yeah, and also, in a way, there's less paperwork involved where certain animals you're working with, for example, a protected species, you need to have all the paperwork in place to be able to physically touch it. But if you could go into the environment and just monitor its environment, it's a good um, good way to kind of um, get around that route as well. Yeah. We've had a great question from Holly um, asking, if you took a sample of London air, what sort of stuff do you think would be in it? Um, and it's an everything. So we, pick, we picked up um, human DNA, a lot of plants um, in a certain area. So plant pollens is quite um, it's quite interesting from that. Um, also, um, various bacteria and uh, fungal uh, spores that lived in the area, like so things from soil. It's very diverse what you pick. It's amazingly diverse, in fact. Yeah. Was there a, was there anything surprising you found? Um, I just think. Just the sheer diversity of what we found was blew my mind in its own right. Because um, when you have such a tiny sample to work with, and when you got the results, and there's so much data coming back, you're like, "Wow, it's 
amazingly diverse for an area. Yeah. Well, it's London, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. 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 So. Uh, can you think of any like, future applications of this technology that it's not being used for at the moment, but you'd love to see? Um, I like to, um, I, I like the whole citizen science approach. Like um, these technologies becoming um, a lot more accessible and cheaper. So, for example, um, I, I'm quite um, a prominent. Um, I, I firmly believe in the whole idea of like uh, greening like urban areas. Like um, so. If we can like green certain sites around, for example, London, like especially near schools, and we could set up projects with schools where they, where they they could take one of these out and start to like understand what's in their local area. I think it will make them have more pride and take more care of what's in their area as well. And especially when certain areas are like that are less green, tend to be more deprived. It gives more scope into like a regreening and more deprived areas of London as well. So. Yeah, that's my kind of like passion, I think. Yeah. And also, I guess having that kind of empirical data can help you protect green spaces that might be under threat. You know, if you can show that it's a biodiversity hotspot or, you know, show its value in a, in a measurable sense rather than that's it right. just deserves not to be built on. Yeah. yeah. And also it shows the positive impact of um, green spaces as well. How the, like, the biodiversity can increase over time as well. So these kids in school can end up setting up these like long-term monitoring projects and the data is real the data is good science data that can be published so these kids can be involved in real scientific data and publications which would be pretty amazing i would have loved that opportunity as a kid <laughs> gateway science <laughs> yeah that's it yeah well, we've had a question from jake on youtube um that is asking more about um kind of the more applications of it and he's asking can edna be applied further than just kind of identifying species, but can you identify individuals? Could you use it to study population dynamics and, and, and you know, maybe look at how individuals within a species are traveling around an environment? Um, certain, if it could be used, yeah, I think so, especially for rewilding projects, when you put in something new that you know is like, wasn't there before and was there, then you can kind of see that impact and change. But I think if you'd want to see one specific individual in London, for example, their effect, it's, it's, yeah, you just don't have that sort of resolution. But if you have like, if you know an area before, during and after, that's how you could kind of figure out whether, what impact they have. Well, it's good to know that I'm not going to be tracked by eDNA whilst walking around. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, can you foresee any, on the subject of that, can you, can you, can you foresee any potential misuses of this technology? Um, I don't know, like I try not to think um, in a sort of malicious way, like with um, <laughs> kind of hopes around sort of science, but um, uh, not that I can think of, maybe I'm being a bit naive here, because um, it's, it's kind of like in understanding your environment, and so um, I, I don't think that there should be, there's any problem with understanding what's around you and how you can use it in a sort of malicious way in the, the 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 data just goes on to help promote what's in your area i think yeah. and also i guess for, you know deepening that understanding of you know what the, the environment that we live in and the, and the environment that we share with other organisms can i guess that can only really help to strengthen that connection and that's the right. connection with nature yeah. it's something that we're really missing in cities i think and again, it's the it's the things that we can't see as well that on the sort of molecular level. So it's not just the foxes, the trees. It's the and it's the bacteria in the soil that's just most important. For example, because they help like um, plants and thrives. And as the plants thrive, they bring in the insects. And as the insects come in, they bring in the birds and so forth. So it's a big like ecosystem out there. And we have finally hit the Jurassic Park question, which is always going to come up in any conversation about genetics. So, uh, if, you know, if you manage to isolate uh, some DNA from, for example, Cheddar Man or from something that you'd gathered from the environment, might it be possible to de-extinct, if, if that's a word, to, to recreate previously extinct species from their DNA that you found in the environment? Um, it's still a challenge that scientists are working on it's basically um the dna that you have 
it's basically someone's got a book and chopped it up into tiny pieces and that book is for an organism so to put the pages together and to make it all make sense so to bring that organism back especially after millions of years of extinction it's still a big sort of challenge so it's i think it's still a good long while yet before we get that sophisticated and you, you you're saying that a lot of this dna is kind of you know shredded up into little little bits a question from uh, another question from Tansy Blues is that does does any of that ever kind of reassemble or self assemble? Is that possible for nucleic acids to do that in the environment? Um, they they seem to be asking in in the context of kind of the origins of life. What do we know about nucleic acids like DNA and RNA outside of living cells? I think no, because again that. They need a whole sort of process in place to help them replicate and things like that. It's and it's in some cases, especially RNA, it's very unstable in the environment and they just become so small that they, they can't really have that much use biologically. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that, I guess that's um, that's really kind of it's re it must be really hard to look back at because you know, all the DNA and all the life that we know is based on kind of cells and nucleic acids and their relationship. And it's really hard, to, really imagine hard to imagine what, what could have come before that relationship. Yeah, and it's kind of like how people, there is some um, thoughts of that, how it came from an asteroid and that created those sort of like amino acids, which were the original virulent block of life. So that's kind of more looking at protein aspect. And that's where proteomics do come in. Proteins do tend to be more stable in the environment. So, Technically, instead of looking at DNA, you could look at, for example, the protein in the bones of um, certain um, really old um, animals and see, um, understand them that way as well. So, for example, people do look at proteins, for example, in teeth to identify what they've eaten and things like that. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. So, Tansy Blue, if you want to start investigating the origins of life, maybe get into proteomics. Um, I think that's a lovely place to wrap it up. Thank you, Darren. This has been absolutely fascinating. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Cheers. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. And thank you at home for joining us as well. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Once again, massive thanks to anyone who's donated. And if you do enjoy the show, please consider making a donation. It's much appreciated and it helps us keep bringing you content like this. We've got more shows coming up. Keep an eye on our website and social channels for more info. On next week's show, my colleague Alistair will be talking to Hein van Groh about some particularly weird chickens that gave Darwin the runaround. In the meantime, there's a ton of other talks, shows and videos on our YouTube channel. And you can stay up to date with what's going on at the museum on our Instagram, Twitter and Facebook pages, as well as our website at nhm.ac.uk. Until then, that was Darren Tunia, I'm Khalil Thurloway, and this has been Nature Live from the Natural History Museum. Goodbye. <laughs>